Kamal Sibyl now into the discussion, former Foreign Secretary. Uh, Kamal Sibyl, thank you for being with us today. Uh, what do you make of uh, some of the revelations, some of the topics touched upon by the External Affairs Minister in his new book, particularly what he says about Nehru vis-a-vis -vis Patel and vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, you know, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, it's not as if uh, this was something planned. You know, these revelations or these exchanges between Patel and uh, Nehru that he sort of uh, thought this was the right time to do it. It actually, in a sense, uh, came out from the fact that uh, he wrote this book. And at the launch of the book, uh, he was asked questions. Uh, and he answered those questions. So that is uh, one. Number two, that uh, we all know this already. There's nothing new. There is no dramatic revelation that Jai Shankar has made with regard to differences between uh, Patel and uh, Nehru on uh, China and, and Nehru's thinking about China. And of course, uh, the blunder that was made in 1962, the assumption that China will not attack, all that you have actually read out in terms of uh, Nehru's response, all these uh, facts are known. It just is that, uh, uh, as I said, the timing of this is related to the launch of his book. And of course, uh, now we are entering into a kind of a electoral phase, 2024 elections, and uh, Nehru has become a point of uh, debate uh, between the BJP and the Congress. And the Congress is extremely, that she extremely sensitive uh, to any criticism uh, of, of Nehru. Uh, what I will say in conclusion is that uh, it is a fact that uh, Nehru blundered badly with regard to China. Uh, right from the start, not realizing that uh, the fact uh, that China occupied Tibet it would pose long-term geopolitical danger to India because for the first time in history, China would become a direct neighbor of India. And the fact that China had uh, uh, not at that point in time, but in 1950, uh, 49, 50, 50, Mao as his helps, and he got into power uh, through the barrel of the gun, uh, through uh, military victories over the, the uh, over the Jankasha government, in a sense that his worldview, his methods of doing diplomacy, his methods of uh, statecraft, were totally different uh, from that of uh, Nehru and our own legacy of uh, ahimsa and non-violence and negotiations and dialogue and uh, we won our independence through me these means rather than uh, through any. Uh, uh, military action, uh, or etc., uh, etc. Et so the, the first of all, the 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 thinking was different, the ideology was different, and then Nehru felt that he was, in a sense, a senior partner. He was more acceptable uh, to the world, and therefore he could, uh, in a sense, introduce China uh, to the rest of the world and make it more acceptable. Communist China, uh, that is, and then he had this notion of Afro-Asian uh, unity. Uh, where if India and China got together, uh, they could then decide the future of Asia without the intervention of the past uh, imperial uh, powers. There was that kind of uh, romanticism. And of course, as we know, there's total uh, misreading of the situation with regard to uh, Mao's uh, uh, intentions towards India and what pushed him to invade India in 1962. So there it is, uh, the controversy uh, has uh, <laughs> come into public uh, discussion once again. But as I said, that uh, it's not something that we are not already aware of. But Maybe do you believe then, in hindsight, Ambassador Sibyl, uh, that, you know, uh, perhaps Jawala Nehru should have paid more heed, attention uh, to Sardar Patel's comments, suggestions, advice, views on this issue in particular? You see, who could at that point of time decide definitively who was right or who was wrong. I mean, in a sense, Patel was the realist. He understood the dynamics of the situation. He understood India's position. He understood the danger from China, given China's background. And as I said, the manner in which the Communist Party uh, took power through military means. And far more importantly, far more importantly, that uh, China was going to become the neighbor. I think any common sense uh, reading of the situation would have said that when a, when two biggest Asian powers abut each other, become direct neighbors for the first time in history, with no past history of relations to really guide them in the future, 
and the worldview being uh, different, they were bound to be they were bound to be a clash. They were bound to be a clash. Uh, China's ambitions were altogether different uh, uh, from ours, even though at the, in terms of development we were not uh, too far apart. At that, at that point in time, we were far more integrated with the world, with the Western world, having been a colony of the British for so long, and our soldiers having fought in all parts of Asia, uh, all parts of the world against uh, during the First and Second World War. And in fact, we, our soldiers also, <laughs> also operated in China <laughs> under British, uh, under the British flag. So China had a different worldview. We had a different worldview. We were more integrated, and Nehru felt that. Uh, if he could have a stable equation with China, then uh, China uh, could be, uh, you know, this whole thing about anti-communism and everything else, that kind of uh, paranoia could be dented and China could be made a more acceptable part of the international community. And we made terrible concessions. 1954, we accepted Tibet uh, as, a, as a part of uh, part of China without, without getting any quid pro quo with regard to the delineation of the border or the settlement of the border. We thought that, you know, if we raised this issue, or at least the advisor felt, especially our ambassador there, that uh, if we raised uh, the issue, we would reop- we would open it. So we will assume that uh, the McMahon line in the east and uh, the, and whatever, there were three lines in the in Ladakh. Yes. So what the line uh, which suited us, that is the border. And then we unilaterally issued a map showing the uh, borders uh, of India as we saw them. Uh, now, it's not that China has a better claim. China has actually a very tenuous claim on Tibet itself. And it's on the basis of Tibet, of the occupation of Tibet, that they claim Indian territory. So this is not to say that there is any right on China's side. But the manner in which the whole issue was dealt with, in hindsight, appears to have been very faulty. And we created... Uh, problems uh, for ourselves. We didn't judge Mao, his intentions, China's rise, China's ambitions, China's system of governance, China's reliance on military power, the the Communist Party of, of, of China, what their worldview was. And not only that, even Stalin had a very negative view uh, of India uh, as being a stooge of the West, as not being fully independent and all that. So I can quite imagine that in the common and, and at that time, Mao and Russia work, were working very closely together. Yes. Uh, I can understand that uh, some of the thinking that the Russians had at that time, uh, the Soviets had at that time, uh, would have also been uh, partaken by, by Mao Zedong about where India stood <laughs> with regard to, with regard to uh, uh, you know, how, how, what India was and its role in the world and whether India could be a trusted and reliable partner. You know, there was another uh, statement made, uh, uh, obviously, which again will have political ramifications by S. Shankar. What's your take on that when he said, uh, you know, if, if the approach had been more Bharat, while talking of Nehru's uh, policy, we would have had a less rosy view of our relationship with China, quote unquote. Well, now, of course, as you know, we have decided that uh, we're going to use uh, the term Bharat to define India rather than India, rather than define India as India. Which, in 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 a sense, uh, would make uh, is appealing, because uh, we identify ourselves with a name that is not of Indian origin, which is of Greek origin or Persian origin or whatever origin there is. It, it's not of Indian origin. There's nothing like India in the entire uh, literature of, of of ancient India, but Bharat, yes. So th- there is this aspect of that uh, if we were more concerned about ourselves, our identity, our culture, our past, our history, our sense of civilizational nationalism, then we would have reacted uh, differently. Though, mind you, there is another aspect to it which is interesting. It is Bharat, in in a sense, which influenced China. After all, Buddhism went from India to China uh, and has such a deep impact on uh, Chinese uh, culture and civilization. That was Bharat <laughs> that was influencing uh, China. But what Jaishankar has in mind is more political rather than civilizational uh, and cultural. So thereby what he means is national self-interest, self-identity, ambition uh, for India, breaking our colonial bonds, thinking of ourselves as uh, our own uh, 
uh, thinking of our own history uh, as the root of our personality and our, and our thinking and building our nation uh, on that basis. So it's in that sense that he said that if we were thinking of ourselves as Bharat, then we would have been more realistic. But if we were looking upon ourselves as India, uh, as a part of uh, the Western world and uh, imbibing many of those ideas and influenced by that and the British policy. Remember for a long time, the Army General of India, the Naval Chief of India, the Air Force Chief of India, they were all Britishers. Uh, we remain a member of the Commonwealth. So we couldn't shed uh, all our uh, past uh, assumptions and interpretations of China, uh, which we had imbibed from the British and British rule. Uh, in, in India. So maybe it's in that sense uh, he means this. Okay. Uh, Kaval Sibul, uh, we leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining us with your perspective on this uh, big story. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.